Maniacs, welcome to the newest episode of the Needless Things Podcast, where we talk about toys, movies, music, and all manner of pop culture dorkery. I am your host, Dave, and winter is here. That's right, today on the episode, me and Beth are going to talk about Game of Thrones, the past seven seasons of action. Uh, I am addicted to the television show. I think it's the greatest thing in the history of TV. Beth has watched the show and read the books, uh, or at least the ones that are available. Uh, so we get uh, differing perspectives on what's going on. We get some comparisons to the action. And obviously, this episode is going to be filled with spoilers. But if you're not watching Game of Thrones already, you probably don't really care. So there you go. I could not be more excited about this show coming back. And uh, we, we had a great, great conversation for it that will be a fun prep for anybody who is looking forward to Sunday night and the beginning of the end. But before we get to that, there are a couple things I want to talk about. Uh, one is I went and saw Us again today with Mrs. Troublemaker because she had not gotten to see it the first time and loved it just as much. And the good news is... Since I got to go see it again, uh, because I actually have gotten a couple of days off work now, hopefully I'm going to be able to talk to Chad this coming Friday, well, today for you guys, and record something for a mini cast, uh, maybe a full episode. It just depends on how it goes. But uh, that, you know, what I had wanted to record originally, we're going to be able to do now because Chad has still got all of his notes and stuff. I got to go see it again, so it's fresh in my brain. And uh, I'm excited. I'm glad that is going to happen. Uh, I also, we also yesterday went and saw Pet Cemetery. Two movies, two days in a row is unprecedented for us because uh, time is, it's usually scheduling is hard, time is hard, everything is hard. Uh, but we went and saw Pet Cemetery. And it was very good. Uh, not necessarily what I expected, which was a, which was a good thing, uh, because the original movie or the original adaptation, however you want to term it, is it, maybe you haven't watched it in a few years, and uh, maybe you don't remember that there's some really bad acting and some really clunky stuff. Uh, but this new one is it's it's good it's very good and i'll be writing a review of it tomorrow to go up probably to you guys yesterday so by the time you hear this uh, my review should be posted depending on how busy i get between now and then but anyway uh two great 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 horror movies that i'm i'm personally very enthused about i'm looking forward to watching pet cemetery again uh knowing uh, you know the benefit to me of watching movies multiple times is the first time you watch a movie, you're so involved in what's going to happen, where is this going, uh, what what is it, that, that you actually miss things. You're so looking ahead that you might miss things that are happening. Uh, so that's... Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that one again, too, because Us was... A, a different experience the second time through, and I'm sure Pet Cemetery will... will be the same way uh also saw shazam that one was a family movie we all went and saw one of the nights that i i was working i worked four days shifts in a row and uh the night of the first one we went and and saw shazam uh i didn't like it as much as everybody else did i don't feel anybody is wrong for liking it because you guys know that's not how i roll uh but I just didn't care for it, and neither did the missus. And you can find that on NeedlessThingsPodcast.com right now, my review of Shazam. Uh, our pal Ryan uh, Schweck wanted to sit down and have a... Dis- uh, de- 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 Sorry, guys. Every once in a while, the thoughts come out too fast for my mouth to handle. Our head of research, Ryan Schweck, wanted to sit down and have a conversation about Shazam, but... After writing the review, I honestly just felt like I didn't have anything more to say about it. Uh, I, I wasn't interested in 
really discussing it because the issues I have are the issues I have, and I don't think there's you know reasoning logicking the the way out of them that's just how it is it's how they decided to make it and and that's fine because my son loved it most people loved it so that's cool that's great and if you haven't seen it yet uh don't let my uh negativity towards it affect you because you may go and you may love it and that's fine and that's great and and the bottom line with Shazam is it is continuing the trajectory away from the negative aspects of what DC had been doing or what Warner Brothers had been doing with their DC movies. So that's nothing but a good thing. So all in all, like, I'm satisfied with Shazam. I just didn't care for it, and I don't see myself watching it again. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's anything else noteworthy that's going on. Uh, the Renaissance Festival uh, is here in Georgia starting this weekend and i am planning on going with phantom jr it will be his first time and it'll be my first time in over a decade uh it's it's i'm excited i'm very excited because i am 100 percent all in on a sardavo seaworth costume and hopefully i can get a couple of pieces while i'm down there but even if i don't uh the renaissance festival is just if if you have the spirit for it, and if if you're the type of person who can get into something like that, uh, it is an absolutely awesome, fun time. I'm stoked. I, I can't wait to get down there and uh, see some horses and knights and kings and winches and uh, f- storefronts and buildings that look just good enough to to be fun and create an atmosphere. Because that's what I'm all about. When when I go somewhere for a fun vacation-y type thing, I want to be taken away. And the Renaissance Festival does a good enough job of of creating a facsimile of that world that you kind of escape for a day. So I'm stoked. That should be a whole lot of fun. If you want more information, just Google Georgia Renaissance Festival. At this point in technology, uh, I apologize if you heard that background noise. That was little Nikki Cross falling off of my printer. I don't know if that picked up or not, but I feel like I need to explain it uh, just in case it did. Oh, speaking of explanations. Oh, okay, first. At this point in technology, do we even need to give out websites anymore? Like, can't we just say the Renaissance Festival is cool and the listener will be like, you guys, we like, oh, Georgia Renaissance Festival. I'm going to look that up. Like, like, do we have to make a big production out of go to the website to see the thing? Uh, it's It's all so easy now. Uh, so anyway, two things I got to explain. One, uh, Nikki Cross just fell off of my printer, and uh, I just picked up her and Ruby Riot uh, as part of Mattel's WWE Elite Collection. Although uh, Ruby is part of the NXT Target Exclusive line, and they're two of the best action figures I have ever bought. The deco on these is absolutely incredible. Uh, the way that they did Nikki's mask and jacket and everything is great. My only issue is they gave her sort of a sedate face. And when have we ever seen Nikki Cross anything but laughing maniacally or screaming? Uh, but still, they, they're amazing figures. And I, I feel lucky that I found them because I think they might in the long run be really, really tough finds. Uh, so anyway, the other thing that requires explanation is towards the end of uh, me and Beth's conversation, there are a couple of times where I speak with what may seem to be unnecessary urgency uh, or emphasis. Let me explain what what's going on there. Uh, Mr. Otis, our 13-year-old boxer, who is a very sweet dog but who is 13 years old, was down here with me when I was recording, and he's he's fine. He's hanging out, and then... Uh, Mrs. Troublemaker and Phantom Jr. get home upstairs and he starts whining really, really loudly to go upstairs. He does not need to go out uh, because that was taken care of before we started recording and he's a fairly continent dog uh, aside from the the fart issue. But maybe maybe that's why he doesn't need to go out more than he did. He's just slowly leaking it out all day long. But anyway, uh, so they get home upstairs. Mr. Otis starts whining and we're in the middle of the conversation and there's not a good stopping point and we're about to wrap it up and I'm like okay we're closing in on the end I just I want to wrap it up and finish up so I can go upstairs hang out with the family whatever I don't want to say hey let's take five let me let him upstairs we'll come back down it would have really interrupted the flow that was going on I I try 
not to put brakes in if I can help it. So what you hear is me talking and gesturing at Mr. Otis to cut it out, stop it, without actually saying, cut it out, stop it. And I don't know why Arnold Schwarzenegger is saying that. But anyway, that's what that is. So if you catch that towards the end of the conversation, uh, and you're like, what is he having a stroke? What's going on? That's what's going on. So anyway, uh, sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy a great conversation about Game of Thrones, preceded by a special musical selection from the highly recommended by Needless Things Game of Thrones Blu-rays. <laughs> This is Maisie Williams as Arya Stark. Swift Turner as Sansa Stark. Isaac Hempstead Wright as Bran Stark. Game of Thrones, huh? What about that thing? That's a thing. It is a. Th- it's a big thing. It's it's only the greatest television show on television. Oh, that show. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, the the one with the guy uh, that played Mick Mars in the Motley Crue movie. It's that show with him in it. Oh, you know, I have not seen that yet, but I saw that he was in it, and I was wondering what kind of horrible bastard he would be in that movie. No, he's he's actually pretty charming. I mean, he's apparently Mick Mars is kind of a, a standoffish type of guy, but he's he's fine. Like it did it didn't bother me that I was watching Ramsey uh, be a Motley Crue person, so it, it worked. It was fine. The movie's not great. It's fun. It's worth watching, but it's not like. Like, nobody's going to be talking about it like they talked about Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> uh, so, like oh, what? Or like they talk about Game of Thrones. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> no, definitely not like that. Uh, so, I only know the TV show. I came into it, I believe, a little ways into the first season. Or, like, maybe right as the first season was ending, because we, we binged most of that season, on, I think, just on demand or whatever, and had just no idea what we were in for. But you sort of knew, because you had read the books. Now, did you read them, like, way back when they came out, or what? Actually, I didn't. I watched the first episode of the show maybe halfway through the first season, I was like, hmm, I don't know. Not sure how I feel about this. And then I was given a giant stack of books to read and immediately started tearing through the books and quickly, quickly surpassed where the show was. But once I started reading the books and watching the show kind of at the same time, I was like, yep, I'm in. Yeah, I was uh, immediately engrossed in the show. I loved it. I loved... uh... I love Ned Stark, the main character of the show. <laughs> uh, which, by the way, for the listeners, if, if you have not watched Game of Thrones or read it or whatever, uh, th- this is going to spoil a lot of things for you. Like the fact 
that the person I thought was the main character of the whole show died at the end of the first season, or was murdered, executed, uh, in front of his daughters, no less, at the beginning of the first season. And, and that was one of the things I was like, well, you know, shows and, and movies are different than books. Maybe maybe he won't die. <laughs> right, even ha- having read the books. Now, did you, when you were watching it, were you like playing catch up or were you watching it them as they aired? I was watching them as they aired once I got into it. I kind of binged until I caught up. Okay. And then I sat down every week and watched them as they aired. Yeah, it, it's you get a lot it's a lot different experience one being able to watch several of them at a time two uh going back and rewatching them because and, I, and i'm curious to know because b- both of us have just recently finished rewatching the the whole first seven seasons uh or i guess existing seven seasons with the eighth and final coming up but going back and rewatching them everything just makes so much more sense. Like I, when you already know what's going to happen, you pay more attention to what's happening and knowing who all the characters are. Cause there's so many characters on this show. And the first time around, you just can't catch how significant anybody is or what everything means or events that they're referring to. Uh, and knowing like, where they're going, what White Harbor is, where uh, I can't remember his name right now. The the uh, the one eyed guy that's the head of the Brotherhood of Banners. Oh, Barrett Dondarian. Yes, uh, I didn't even realize that. Now it was a different actor, but the character is in the first season, in the I think the very first episode. Yeah, I'd missed that too. And yeah, lots of little things like that where you're so overwhelmed with information and characters the first time, you just can't pick up on all of it. And then the second time through, you really get to enjoy it a whole lot more. That's the experience I had. Did you Now, having read the books, I'm sure you were a little ahead of the curve at least, but what what was your your second viewing experience like? Well, I mean, second recently i i've actually seen all seven seasons multiple times cuz i'm a big dork oh okay but, <laughs> but my most recent one i picked up on a lot of foreshadowing and and things that you just can't notice the first time around and when you you see little fingers scheming or someone says a line that you think is a throwaway but it gets thrown back in their face two seasons later you're like oh shit i didn't even notice that the first time so there is a difference i think with the binging because being able to watch four or five episodes at once you kind of are picking up on more rather than just watching them one at a time because you do forget and well, you don't remember the tiny little detail the other thing about watching it again is i realized years of time are passing in that show uh, I don't know. I'm sure there's a timeline out there somewhere, but I mean, we're talking like what seven, eight, nine years between the first season and the most current season. I honestly don't know the timeline, but yeah, it would have to be something like that. Yeah, I mean, we're it, it, around, you know, a- approaching a decade for sure. But there are episodes where months pass within the episode. And that's one of the things that the first time around, it sort of felt like everything was on top of each other. But this time, you know, the first few seasons actually feel very spread out and sort of taking their time and building and watching the sixth and seventh seasons, particularly the seventh season originally, I felt like, what what is going on? Everything is moving too fast. They're really rushing things. But you realize watching it all over again, they're not. That's just the pace that we've been building to over the course of these seven seasons. They've been slowly eliminating pieces from the board and characters and things like paring away all the extraneous stuff and getting down to business because the big war is coming. Like, that's what we're headed for. 
And so much of what we watched, as engrossing as it was, doesn't matter in the context of the big battle against the White Walkers, which is which is kind of the point of the whole show, is that look at all the ridiculous bullshit the humans are doing to each other when there's a way bigger problem they're going to have to deal with. And I, and I think being able to take it all in, you know, I, I think it took me maybe about four weeks to rewatch the whole thing. And watching it in that time frame, you really realize the themes of the show uh, are really well executed over the course of these seasons. Well, and some of the earlier stuff may seem a little slow at parts, but there there is clearly a reason behind every single thing that they do. Well, yeah, and every conversation is fascinating. Like, and that was that was what I loved about the show is uh, to to compare it because when this when I started watching this, I was still walking uh, still watching Walking Dead at the time, and part of the reason that I finally quit watching Walking Dead is because every single conversation on Game of Thrones was fascinating and interesting to watch and like the performances were just riveting even if they were just standing around a courtyard it was there was so much going on whereas Walking Dead where they just stand around and talk all the time they weren't fascinating conversations and having that direct comparison between the two shows really drove home just how great Game of Thrones is and just how much I was not enjoying Walking Dead at the time. Well, and and even if it is people just standing around with their political machinations, it all means something. It's not, well, we don't have a big battle this week, so let's just have people talk and do some stuff. It it all mattered. Even, you know, Tywin Lannister sitting around doing paperwork. That paperwork was getting Walder Frey on his side. Right. Right. Kill everybody for him. So it wasn't like, okay, he's just going to sit around and write some letters this episode. No, he's doing some shit, and it's going to matter. And it matters now, and it's going to matter more once you see the Reigns of Castamere. And once, uh, you know, to be fair to The Walking Dead, Game of Thrones all along has known exactly where it was going. It just didn't always know how quickly it was going to get there. But there there was an end game. They knew what it was. They knew where all of the families and all the characters had to be to get there. So they did have a little more direction and a little more urgency with the storytelling. Rather than just, oh, who are they going to fight this next two seasons? Oh, it's some other evil guy. All right. Yeah, right, right. Who cares? <laughs> All right, well, so we, we've talked a little bit sort of a, about the show overall, but in order to keep things uh, on track and, and set our own specific goals for the end game of this episode, uh, I, we've, we've got a list of things that we're going to discuss uh, specifically because I don't want to sit here and go over season by season everything that happened because that, you know, I, one, I would rather somebody actually sit down and watch the show. And two, I, who who needs a recap at this point? If you are a fan, uh, what I would do is what I would like to do is for us to just sort of go back and forth with some specific topics. And the first one is your top three main characters. Now, I didn't define this when I sent it to you, but what I had in mind, and I figured you'd know what I meant. We're talking about the main people, the the families that are the big names on the show that we've been following from the beginning until now. So uh, just who are your three, like the three main characters that are, are the ones that are really driving you in the show? Um, so in order of most favorite to least most favorite, I would say Arya, Tyrion, and Jamie. Oh, our lists are so very close. I kind of um, thought we'd be on the same page on this one. I, I didn't list them in order of, of favoritism, but I just threw the three out there. It's Arya, uh, Daenerys, and Tyrion. And uh, Jamie w- was, he's my top five for sure, because he, he is really one of the most interesting characters. But the problem is your top tier of characters are all so interesting uh, that it's it, it's hard to pick. I did I do think uh, the fact that we both picked the supposed good guys of the show is is worth noting. 
So since we both picked Arya, let's talk about her a little bit. Now, from the books, uh, it, how closely does her television journey mirror what's in the novels? It's pretty on the nose. It, it really has a lot less of the... Well, the books obviously haven't gotten very far with the, the ninja school story. Right. Not before... She was too far into ninja school. I believe the last book ended with her being in Bravos and, and starting to train, but didn't get into all the, the specifics of her ninja school. But otherwise, her storyline has been pretty on the nose with the books. And when she sees, you know, her entire family destroyed and everyone who tries to help her either gets killed or they leave her. And... how she handled the phrase and little finger because it's it's totally not anywhere in the books was brilliant and i was cheering for her the whole damn time now some of the ninja school stuff after a while got a little boring i was like good god can you just leave already just go home well, just what, go home what was funny to me about uh her time in bravos was that the first time around it seemed to me that she was there a very short time to have been turned into a ninja and that she did everything wrong. Like, and I was really dissatisfied with that portion of her story because she is one of my favorite characters. And she's actually, when I made my little list there, she is the one that I named first, uh, because I like her, her path and so many of her interactions, like her time with the hound. I, I love, I, I want an Aria and the hound road show, uh, like a, a buddy, a buddy traveling show. Yes, absolutely. Uh, they were, they were great together and that's, you know, not only did we get to see her story, but it really personified the hound a whole lot more than we had seen thus far. Like we, we'd had sort of glimmers that he was an okay guy mostly, but that is where we really started to see he's, yes, he's a badass. Yes, he'll cut your head off for nothing. But he does have sort of a, a moral center, sort of. But but with Arya, uh, this last time, I actually felt like her time with the, the uh, faceless people working for the faceless god, whatever, who is, okay, what's his name? He's got a cool name, Jakar. Jacan, what is it? Jacan Hagar. Yes, that sounds good. I'll accept that. Uh, this time it all worked a little bit better because, again, the time passing is something you're able to to calculate a little bit better once you've already been through. And I feel like she might have been there for a couple of years. Um. I don't, it, you know, it, it seemed like maybe she was there a few months initially, you know, my, my first run through, but I think it was much, much longer than that. And the repetitiveness of it and the fact that it kind of dragged to me actually lent itself to the idea that she was in a school of sorts and that she was learning. Uh, it, it really worked for me better the second time around. Well, and as far as her doing everything wrong, you know, the whole point of her being there was that she was supposed to give up who she was. Right. She was succeed in the school, and she was never going to give up who she was. She was never going to forget that right. she had to go home and kill some people. And and that's the thing, is her intent seems a little more clear this time, is that she, from the start, she's basically using this place. Like, because, and, and, and you see it when she hides Needle at the beginning, it should have been more apparent to me that, oh, she has no intention of living their way of life and doing their thing. She's going to use this place to get the skills she needs to have to go murder motherfuckers. So it it plays a lot better when you have more context and when you, again, when you know what's going to happen so you're paying attention to what's happening, if that makes sense. It does. And, you know, knowing a little bit more about how she's thinking from reading the books. I guess it's it was more clear to me because even if they didn't make it clear in the show, I knew that right, she was not right. changing who she was. 
and that is one thing that you get from the books that you you know can't get from the shows. You can't get everything that everybody's thinking all the time. Well, ever since, and, and here's my stance on the books. Uh, as soon as the show's over, I'm going to read them, uh, or <laughs> read the ones that are out anyway. Uh, but I, when I discover a new movie or television show or whatever that's based on a series of books, I have stopped running out to read the books first because uh, Harry Potter and one other thing, and I can't remember what it is right now, but I had two experiences where I did that, where I was like, I, like I watched the first Harry Potter movie. And I was like, oh, wow, that's actually really good. I'd like to read the books. And I read all the books, and the rest of the movies were all disappointments to me. Uh, and they're not bad movies, but the books are so good, and there's so much more there, there's so much depth there, that the movies just couldn't capture. And if I had not read the books, I would have enjoyed those movies, because I wouldn't have known what I was missing. So now I wait. I watch the thing first, and then I'll go read the books afterwards, which is which was my determination here. And I, especially with Game of Thrones, because I do think it's the best television show ever. Yes, even over Buffy. Uh, and I really didn't want the books to to spoil it in any way for me. Well, and there is one thing with the books, though, that there's a lot of filler in the books. I have Those heard. Books, <laughs> they are. There is so much stuff. I mean, they really just pared down to get to the show, and 99% of the pairing that they did was spot on. And I think one thing that the show has done that kind of maybe has slowed Martin down, hopefully there's an excuse for it, is that he was forced to have an endgame. And when you're reading the first couple books, you don't know where it's going because there's for all the characters that are in the show, double that, and it's the books. Oh, my gosh. And that's so many plot lines, and he was just, I don't know if he's been unwilling to chop away the fat until he was forced to for the show, but I think it's, it's kind of put the spurs to him, and now he's just lost, like, oh, shit, I don't have any idea how I'm going to wrap up these 5,000 plot lines. Well, do you think the show has really pressured him into anything though or is he still just sort of doing his own thing with the books i mean i can't imagine he cares the 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 only extent to which i think he cares about the show's effect on his story is maybe concerned that it's it's done it better than he could have but i I don't don't, i don't mean that it's pressured him as in oh shit i better hurry up and write because obviously that's not happening Well, right 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 but i just mean like I, I don't, I don't know that I think he feels any compulsion to to mirror anything that's happened on the show. No, I don't think so. But I think he also is stuck, you know, in a way to shit. The show is able to wrap this up in two seasons, and I've got two books to go, and I don't know how to wrap this shit up. <laughs> well, that's entirely possible. Um, let's talk a little bit about Daenerys now, because I, she is probably my. Th- favorite character on the show or at least the one like if i had had to have picked one to say she can't die she's got to make it till the end she would be the one for obvious reasons uh she has had a hell of a journey there are times when up until this this refresher viewing there have been times where i really thought like man she's really doing some dumb shit but now i feel like all the decisions uh, decisions that she made were very real, were very true to who her character is, were definitely an important part of the story. And if she had been this flawless heroine, she would not be half as interesting. Uh, if she'd made all the right decisions and just conquered everywhere she went and hadn't run into... I mean, obviously she'd still run into problems, but like some of her problems of her, are of her own making. But that just makes her more compelling to me. See, I kind of just lost interest in her when it became season after season of what we called dicking around in Marine. (laughs) Because I get why she stayed, and I understand the point of it, and I understand what she was trying to do. But after a while, I was just like, oh, my God, stop talking about Westeros and just go there. And, And I don't disagree with that. But now I feel like all that time was earned because 
we're never going to get to see her as as a ruler really like i don't think this show is going to end with a and then 10 years later and show whatever is going on uh and i think it was important for us to see ha- who she was as an actual queen so that we could get more behind her or not you know i think i think there is a little bit of audience decision as to to how effective she is but i think it was really good to show that yes she can do this job yes she is staying true to her original goals even though she has this power like she's not corrupted by what happened there although we do see from time to time the the that tyrannical targaryen side of her that wants to come out every once in a while uh like when she burns uh the boltons and uh when she crucifies or not crucifies but nails all the slave masters you know on the mile markers there there are times oh, yeah. when she goes against her advisors and it's i'm not saying it's wrong but they're definitely those brutal warlord tendencies yeah when she um the episode in the season i just finished watching when she just said everything and everyone she can find on fire like okay slow it down a little bit Maybe listen when Tyrion says you're acting crazy, baby. Right, and and that's the thing, and that that's that's why to me that time in Marine in Slavers Bay was actually important and worthwhile. Is it gave us that that facet of her character? But I, I think Amelia Clark is absolutely fantastic on the show. Uh, I, I I don't know. I have no idea where the next season is going to go, and we're not really going to talk about that a whole heck of a lot. Uh, because we do have to move on, but uh, Daenerys was not on your list. Instead, uh, you had the Golden Boy, the most handsome man in the world. Let's talk about him. Well, the reason I went with him over uh, Daenerys was at at what other point in any other show would you sit down and find yourself rooting for a guy who threw a seven-year-old out of a tower window after he caught him fucking his sister. <laughs> yeah, that's that's and a yeah, very good point. And we love him. Or at least most people love him now. He's gone, I think he's gone through the most changes, personality and character-wise, since the start of the show. Then He's changed more than any other character. And I do get the feeling he's starting to see that Cersei really is kind of the worst. Oh, I absolutely think so, and I, I I would even go so far as to say the vibe when he left her to to go meet up with the North was the same realization he probably had before he had to slay the king. And that if she wasn't his sister, he probably would have killed her then and there. And that's one of the things that I loved finding out about him was that he didn't kill the king just because he's an asshole. He killed the king because the king was about to blow up the entire damn town. Right. And and, and that's, yet nobody can forgive him for that. And again, those shades of, of you know, the, the people of the past with Cersei having recently blown up the entire sept and the district around it using the means that the Mad King was going to use. Like, it's very interesting to see those little degrees sort of creep in. And and Cersei, uh, real quick, I want to talk about her because we got that, you know, we see her character being vicious in protection of her family and what she loves and believes in. But then we get that one season, I can't remember which one it was, I think it was season four maybe, that opened with her as a child. And the prophecy of her, oh, yeah. of her three dead children, and it, it's a really interesting thing and something very different. Uh, it was the first flashback that we got in the show, and it was also, you know, this idea that, because Game of Thrones, obviously, there there's dragons, there's shadowy demons that come out of red witches' vaginas there's there's magic for sure 
but it's not at the forefront. This isn't Lord of the Rings. There's no Gandalf. Uh, but again, that prophecy, it happened, and there was nothing she could do to avoid it. And that that's another suggestion that this is... It, it's another one of the sort of fantasy elements of the show that's it's it's there on the side and it's important but it's not what the show focuses on because that was one of the things that actually made me think about her lack of reaction when she finds out Tommen's killed himself right is you know she was so bent out of shape about joffrey dying and so upset about marcella dying but then Tommen jumps out a window and she's like all right give me the crown is was she just like all right fuck it prophecy Nothing i, I, I think can so. do it. I think so, and I think her shock over Joffrey, I mean, Joffrey, her, her little monster, and, and the, the conversations that she had about him where she acknowledged how horrible he was were, were very interesting. But Joffrey dying was the first indication that that prophecy was happening. And Marcella, again, was, oh no, that, that I've lost another one and so, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. By the time Tommen went, she she had resigned herself that that was it, and now it's time to kill everyone who isn't us. And to start wearing a lot of black and really rock that mom haircut. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, so let's move on to – well, we, we didn't talk about Jamie quite enough, I don't think. I, I, I do love the character of Jamie. I do think that his – I don't know that his char- I don't know that I feel his character has changed the most. I feel his character has been revealed the most. Uh because we do start the show and he's nothing but an incestuous king murderer. And as we go on, we learn like in his interactions with Brienne and in his interactions with Tyrion, he he's again he's not bad he's just lived his he, his life has been a certain way and has afforded him the luxury to make the choices he's made now one horrible thing he does is the uh when he's in the prison cell with his cousin and they they exchange the story about how they were both squires and then he just straight up murders him in order to get out of the cell that was pretty rough <laughs> He, he, well, you talked about how we all we picked all the good guys, but really there aren't any. Well, there are maybe one or two good guys well, on this if, show. If you also various shades of gray. If you had seen me, I was making air quotes when I said good guys because it, it is very much, and I think that's one of the greatest things about the show is it gives us this perspective of who who we think of as a good good guy is somebody else's villain. Like, Daenerys is essentially presented as the heroine of the show. But to all of these people in Westeros, she's this evil foreign invader. To them, she's the bad guy. And and while we know better, the characters don't have the benefit of all the information that we have. Uh, and 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 it's they've done it such a good job with that from every perspective where we've seen... Uh, We've seen people in the North do horrible things. Uh, the, the Boltons, the flayed man is their freaking banner. That's their habit. And the only reason they stopped doing it is because uh, the Starks forbade it. But they're still people, a family, whose thing is skinning people alive. So, like, even though we kind of think of the North as, like, that's where the good guys are. They're horrible no, people up there, too. What was that? It's where that one group of good guys are, and you see how well things have gone for the Starks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the, but that's that's one of the reasons I adore the show so much is because it it does present all of these different narratives and give you the opportunity to see from different people's points of view. Uh, and and of course the the one of the people I can't say the only person, but one of the people who's very good at seeing everybody's point of view is uh, is our hero. Tyrion Lannister, the the uh, initially drunken, sex crazed dwarf, <laughs> who uh, who becomes a little less drunk and sex crazed. I can't. Yes, yes. I can't quite say the moral center of the show because I'm going to save that for somebody else. But uh, 
Tyrion is certainly he gets all the best lines. Uh, he gets all the best drama- big dramatic moments. Uh, his interactions with every character are golden because he has chemistry with everyone. Uh, and and Peter Dinklage is just one of the greatest actors working today. That guy is freaking amazing. And I'm not saying that like, you know, for a little person. I'm just saying he's badass <laughs> and awesome. And even if his English accent gets a little iffy sometimes when he says song saw, it's okay. I can look past that one tiny thing. Well, and here's the thing, though. The advantage is that they're in a fantasy world where it's not an English accent. So there, there can be deviations in, you know, the Dorn. Uh, Dorns have sort of a Spanish inflection or Hispanic, whatever, inflection. Uh, Westeros, for the most part, has sort of an English accent, but but they're not Spanish and English. They're they're just sort of it's like Conan. It's like those things, but it's not. So it doesn't bother me too much when the accents maybe get a little dodgy from time to time. It doesn't happen often because no, he's no. that good. He's yeah, in a yeah. show filled with English people, and other than maybe one word. You can't tell he's not English. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I he, Tyrion is just fantastic. He's gotten so many horrifying moments, but he's also gotten some really nice triumphant moments. I think, and this kind of leads into one of the other characters, but I want to go ahead and get it right now because I want to be sure and talk about it. One of the biggest shocks of the show uh, which which I, it didn't register this way initially, but the double shock of the mountain fighting Oberon, Oberon Martell, and killing him because it really looked like, obviously they were setting it up where Oberon was being far too, not even cocky, but too insistent that the mountain needed to confess which was totally unnecessary. He should have just killed him, and he could have killed him, which is the tragedy of it. Uh, But then when the mountain kills Oberyn, not only is this awesome new character that, you know, we've been following for this season is dead, but also Tyrion is now doomed. Uh, At his father's hand, no less. Like, that to me was one of the biggest shocks of the whole show. That that's one of the things that I knew was going to happen. It didn't make it any easier to watch or more pleasant to see Oberyn's cockiness get his head squished. <laughs> is that but, how is that how it went down in the book? I mean, I, I, I obviously he died, sound. but yeah, it was a squishy sound. <laughs> no, um, I mean it it did play out pretty much the exact same way in in the book, and so I knew what was happening, but it was still the acting makes such a big difference. So seeing the look on Tyrion's face and just seeing all of these things, even though you know how it's going to happen in the books, watching it actually happen and seeing the things that he does with the character make a huge difference. Well, and and Pedro Pascal did such a good job with that character. I, I don't know at all what he's supposed to be like in the books, but he managed to take this sort of decadent spoiled seeming guy but make him very likable immediately he he was pretty much the same guy in in the books but again charisma on a page is very different than charisma on a screen yeah absolutely absolutely uh anything else about Tyrion before we move on did you have any specific points about him no just that i find him one of the most tragic characters in the show, if not the most tragic, because he is brilliant, he is hilarious, and he actually does care about people. He loves people. Yeah. But no one can look past his name and his face to give him anything in return. And that's just very sad. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, So those are our big favorites, but the supporting cast of Game of Thrones is is in most cases just as engrossing as the primary characters that we've been following. Also, I'd like to point out neither one of us picked Jon Snow. Poor Jon Snow. <laughs> I love Jon Snow, but he... Uh, 
Well, he's been burdened with some of the draggier storylines, I think, and they were all necessary. But I think out of all of the characters, he's the one that his screen time the mo- has dragged the most for me. Agreed. I still like him. I just, I, I he's never going to be at the top for me no. unless he does something amazing in this next season, which right. I don't think. Mean. Well, I mean, at this point, I, I think our viewpoints on everybody are pretty much locked in at this point. I, next season, I don't think is about going to be about really any kind of revelations. It's just going to be about that momentum and about who manages to do what. Uh, so, our supporting cast, uh, I wanted to talk about our top five supporting characters because I think we'll probably talk about them a little bit less than we did our primaries. Uh, and my top five were... Brienne of Tarth, uh, Sandor Clegane, the Hound, Podrick, Davos Seaworth, and Bronn of the Blackwater. Uh, we got a little overlap. Okay, okay. Well, I, I just, all of those, I, I'm delighted every time I see them on screen. Who were yours? Mine are Tormund Giants Bane, Sir Davos, Bronn, Brienne, and then I went back and forth several times on this, but I picked Varys over the Hound. Oh, yeah, Varys was very close to making it on my list. Uh, and I love him, but he's he's kind of one note. Uh, he's great, and he's he's everything he does is interesting, but out of all the characters, I think he has had zero growth because he is my moral center of the show, He's the one that only cares about Westeros. Uh, his allegiance is to the people of Westeros and to the good of the Seven Kingdoms. That's actually in my notes. He's every bit as sneaky as Littlefinger, but he's using his wits and everything he has for the realm, not for a person. Exactly, and that's and and he never changes, which is awesome, and I love it. But it does make him slightly less compelling as a character uh just 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 compared to to brienne and, and the hound and Padre, like all the ones that we named all get these great little moments and and it, and again it's the interactions that make this show so incredible because seeing davos uh try to which it took me forever to learn to say davos and not davros <laughs> i did um, that at first yeah uh, but seeing him just trying to find a cause uh, is is so powerful to me that the, he's this good, smart man uh, with good instincts and maybe just bad decision making <laughs> for a long time. Bad at picking kings for a little bit. Yes, yes. Uh, and then Podrick is very very incidental character but every moment he's on screen he's great he's one of the few completely bright spots of the show he is enjoyable because he is just kind of hapless and and not in a bad way it it's just he's he's along for the ride and he's he's just trying so damn hard just and, like Brienne he, he's just trying so damn hard to do something Yes, yes, exactly. And the funny thing about him is, as you know, at fir- that we f- we first meet him as uh, Tyrion's squire, and he saves Tyrion's life. But then, as we really get to know is because then he's just sort of a face, like you don't attach a whole lot of significance to him. But they start to flesh him out a little bit, and you're like, oh, they're going to kill him, aren't they? He's going to die, but he's he's made it. He's made it to the new season. Well, when he and Gendry both kind of got pushed off to the side for a while, and then Pod came back on the show, I don't know if he was, he was just maybe wasn't on a, a bunch of episodes for a while. Yeah. For a minute there, I was like, is that Gendry, or is it Podrick? <laughs> I don't even know who you are anymore. They are <laughs> both. Gendry isn't. They are both sort of generically, ruggedly handsome white guys. Like, there's... Either one of them could have been cast for either role. But apparently Podrick has a bigger dick, so... 
<laughs> it's very true. The the delight. Oh man, I can't remember exactly what the line is. Uh but when they all meet up before the uh the big council where they show Cersei the White Walker and uh Braun and, and Podrick sort of run into each other again. And he says, I guess I better do what you say before you assault me with that thing. <laughs> it's something, something along those lines. And and man, what a what an awesome moment that was, that march to the uh what the Dragon Pit, is that what it was called? Yeah. And I apologize to the listeners who are familiar with the show, but it's even having just watched it, there's so much information and so many specific names for things that there's a lot of stuff that that's just unless I was gonna write down every name and every place in the show, I just knew I wasn't going to remember. But when they're on the march to the Dragon Pit and everybody gets to have these little meetups and these little dialogue exchanges, uh, it's, it's just such nice stuff. You know, well, because these characters have all been around each other for so long and in various ways that it's, it's nice to see, oh, look, they're, they're coming back together. They're getting the band back together. Right, right. And it was the first time, that meeting was the first time so many of those characters had even been in the same place at the same time. Which you forget about because you're so used to seeing them all on the same episode. Right, but then you realize that you have Cersei and Daenerys and Jon Snow and and all they're all right there. And it's like, whoa, this is happening. Uh, so let's let's uh, move on through our supporting characters. Uh, I, I think I've talked enough already about how much I love the Hound uh, and and Davos. Bron, I just want to touch on Bron real quick. He's just great. I love how straightforward he is uh, when he has hooked up with Jamie after Tyrion left, and now he's Bron of the Blackwater, and he's got a title. And he's waiting for just the right castle and just the right woman, and he makes it very clear that you know I this this is where my money's coming from now. We're still friends, but I'm not on your side. Like it, it was, I I have to admire Bronn's straightforwardness and and Great. single per single mindedness because he has loyalty only to himself. He's the polar opposite of Varys. He he only wants what he's going to get out of it. Oh, Tyrion's gone. All right, who's gonna who's gonna take care of me now? Right, right, absolutely. And he loves that in the books. After Tyrion disappears, Bronn just vanishes. You don't really hear about him again. But I I do appreciate the show finding a way to keep him around yeah. by pairing him with Jamie because I absolutely love him. He and Davos are on my list of characters I don't want to see die. Well, and that's actually, the before we leave this topic, uh, I want to quickly run down, was there a moment where you were positive any of these were going to die? For me, uh, Brienne, at no point did I really think she was going to die. No. Uh, the Hound, I thought, after their fight, we didn't see him die on screen, but it still felt very final to me. So I, I was afraid he was dead there. Podrick, I, I've, I didn't have a specific instance, but just once I, basically once I knew his name and his face, I was like, they're probably going to kill him. Uh, Davos. Came oh, close in the, the Blackwater. Yeah. That, and actually that's the only time I really thought he was going to die. And I just figured, well, he's, he's out of luck. He's done. And then Braun. Uh, Bronn, when the uh, when the dragons attacked the Lannister wagon train on the way back from, uh, oh shoot, High Garden. Yeah, I thought Bronn was going to die. I was a hundred percent, no doubt in my mind. I thought he was going to die, and I yeah, was I so he was. happy he didn't. And then um, m- one of mine that wasn't one of yours was Tormund, and he's almost died like ten times, and might be dead. And then still might be dead, yeah. I, I don't think he is because, again, he did not die on screen. But we don't know because that was pretty – last time we saw him uh, was in the middle of the wall melting thanks to the most tragic thing that's happened on the show yet. But it was also the most metal. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, let's see. Best family. My, I, what, what was your pick for best family? This was very tough as well. Uh, so I went with the Mormonts. 
Oh, interesting. Okay. I tried not to pick a, you know, a main family because, honestly, the Starks are great, but they're all too damn good, or at least the men are. They're right. all too nice. They're all too noble. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Lannisters are, for the most part, too evil. Boltons like to chop people up. The Greyjoys are terrible. But the Mormonts, you've got Jor Mormont, the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. He's an old man and a badass. No, wait, that's uh, Jorah's, Daenerys' guy. No, um, Jorah is Daenerys' guy. Jor was his father, who was Lord Commander oh, of the Night's oh, Watch. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But also, he's a badass, too. Jory had damn grayscale and then sat and let somebody peel it off of him. Oh, my gosh. Badass. That was hard to deal with. It was it was tough to watch because I think I had just eaten when we'd seen that episode, too. <laughs> but also, the, the best part has come in in the last couple of seasons with the Mormonts is Leanna Mormont is, like, 10 years old, and she is tougher than 90% of those guys sitting in the halls at Winterfell. Those scenes were a little much for me this time around. The first time around, I was like, oh, isn't she just fierce and cute? But this time I was like, all right, let's 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 pull that back a little bit. The, I liked the, it. The lords, and I, and I like it, but the, the lords of the north cowering in the face of this little girl was was a little much for me this time around. But it's it's fine. I don't, I can't say I have a problem with it, but I was just like, all right, let's, Let's keep going. <laughs> well, what was your favorite family then? Uh, my favorite family, surprising me, because I had to really, really think about this. Uh, my my natural reaction is the Starks. But when I really thought about it, the family that's given me the most bang for my buck, entertainment value-wise, are the Lannisters. Uh, Cersei and Jamie are both just excellent when they're on screen. It's great. Uh, we already talked about how wonderful Tyrion is. And then we also have to talk about Tywin Lannister, who was, man, I, oh, shoot, what is the actor's name? Help me out. Stance. Charles Stance. Oh, my gosh. He was just amazing to the point where he was horrible to you know Tyrion and just a ruthless bastard but well not literal not in this not in the game of thrones sense of the word <laughs> but uh you wanted him to die but then when he did I was like oh man now he's not going to be on the show anymore yeah I was the same way it's like I knew and I knew it was coming too and I said oh man maybe they'll change this too right right so I I've <laughs> got to say the Lannisters are the uh, you know they're they're not the ones I'm rooting for, but they sure are the ones that are, that keep me coming to the show. They are fun to watch. I will definitely give you that. They're, they're like Rick. if the Game of Thrones was wrestling, they're Ric Flair. <laughs> I just want to go and boo them and and see them eventually get their comeuppance. They're they're the heels that keep me coming back. Uh, so one of the big things about Game of Thrones uh, th that honestly I feel is a little overblown. Uh, because there's much, much more to this show than just the shocks. But the the moments that shock us are built to so well, they do seem to come out of nowhere, but at the same time when they're done, you see that there was no other way things could have happened. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the most shocking moments of the show and I think the first one to get out of the way, and, and I'll be inter interested to know if you agree with me, is, is the Red Wedding. I think that's the one we have to talk about first. I thought it was an amazing episode, but it was very, very difficult for me to know that episode was coming and keep my mouth shut to all the people I knew who did not read the books. <laughs> sure. I did it. I came through. I didn't spoil it for anybody. Um, even though I knew it was happening, it was still so good to watch it be done live or you know yeah, filmed. yeah. but it, it was every bit as brutal and as horrifying as it is in the books and probably even more so just because of the actual acting and emotion that you can see so even though i knew it was coming it was still extremely good to watch well again seeing you know, having actual people faces on a screen is a very different experience from the characters that you've built in your head. 
uh, because you've become attached to them in a different way. But uh, yeah, it was it was horrifying, and and again, the first time through, I was like, "No, why is this happening?" Then I was like, "Oh, because Rob is an idiot." Yep, just like his daddy. Yep. Uh, yeah, that so that was that was brutal. It was horrifying. It was much easier for me to watch the second time around, unlike some other things that happen on the show, uh, because again, really being able to absorb the story on the second viewing. Uh, it it didn't feel, you know, Walter Frey is still a horrible, horrible, horrible person, one of the worst characters on the show, but it didn't feel as, oh no, my my heroes are, are just being murdered this time. It really more felt like, well, they had that coming. Yeah, it, it didn't feel like, oh no, poor Robin. Poor right. family, and oh, oh, everybody's from the north is dying. It was just like, well, yep. They they Even knew, many, so. yeah, they knew what they were doing. Yeah, uh, which, which to me is another sort of interesting aspect of so many of the characters in the show that you also get to see people who are doing their duty versus people who are making vile choices versus people who just get caught up in situations and that's why let's see do I, did I put yeah I have okay so we'll get into most most evil villain uh, in just a minute here uh, another shocking thing and this is the one that that was hard for me both times I watched well actually this it's the third time I watched this episode uh, I just didn't watch the season in its entirety uh, was Viserion getting turned uh, was it's still hard for me to take. Interesting. I oh my You're gosh! Invested in a dragon. It it broke my heart because they have they spent as much time building the characters of those dragons as in as much as you can build the character of an animal uh, as they have some of the characters on the show because we we saw them be born. We saw them go through their difficult adolescent years. We saw them become adults and sort of, in a way, accept their duty uh, to Daenerys. And we had gotten to this point where they were all on board. They were all working together. They were acting as her literal children. And, you know, right as, wow, everything's going great, on top of the world, Daenerys can get from one end of the continent to the other in like five minutes, which is really impressive. And I know that's exaggerating, but uh, and and then for that to happen, I mean, it it really just killed me. It, it's devastating to me. And then to well, v- Viserion dying was devastating. And then for the almost blasphemy of the Night King bringing. Viserion back as a white, uh, was, which I didn't see coming. I was that? just like, oh no! I didn't see it coming. I was just like, oh no! The dragon's dead. That's awful. Right, right. I just never, it never occurred to me that there would be a zombie dragon. And and that was just, it was another one of those one-two punches of of this horrible thing happened, and then it gets made even worse. Uh, so that that one was brutal. Uh, what what have you got? What's one of your most shocking moments? Well, I had two, and I couldn't pick between them. One of them was well, okay. The second one wasn't really as shocking as it was just deeply upsetting. But my my most shocking and upsetting one was when Stannis let Melisandre burn his child alive. Oh yeah, that was so fucked up. I was just like, wait, this is this is actually happening? No. No, somebody's going to stop. Somebody's going to step in and stop this, and then no one steps in and stops it. But, but she's screaming. Somebody put the damn flames out. I just honestly did not think that that was going to go all the way through. I kept expecting Davos to just swoop in and save her or something. But I, I, out of all the horrible things I've seen on this show, burning a small child alive was way out there for me. 
yeah i that that was horrifying uh and and it wasn't yeah well it was shocking it was absolutely shocking uh what was what was your alternate my alternate was uh the death of hodor oh yeah that was upsetting that one uh, again i i for me I, I wouldn't call that a shock but it was it was very upsetting <laughs> Well, it was shockingly upsetting. Yes, yes. It, it was shocking to me how upset I could be about it. A tertiary character, not even a secondary character, completely tertiary. And that episode also happened to air on my birthday. So I was like, hey, happy birthday to me, HBO. Thanks a lot <laughs> for trying to cry on my birthday. Oh. But I was so pissed at Bran at the end of that episode. I was like, so not only did you break Hodor and cause him to live his entire life, mentally handicapped but then you get him killed good job Dick. well at that point though as, as he says in a, a later episode at that point he's not even brand anymore uh he he's the three-eyed raven that that, that transformation <laughs> is complete and his concern his, his concerns are not those of mortals but of of higher beings i guess well i think mira reed was right in the last season when she took her leave she said Bran died in that cave. You're not Bran. Right. She was 100% right. Okay, so let me ask you that. As somebody who's read the books, uh, I was one of the most confusing things on the whole show to me were who the heck those kids were and where they came from. And I, I, a brief glance at Google showed me that in the books it looks like they were fleshed out quite a bit more. But on the show, they just kind of show up out of nowhere and like, hey, Bran, we're going to take you north. So the children of the forest used to live on all of Westeros, and then they kind of got it pushed back by men, and they they were the ones who had the magic. So all these prophecy things and, and brands, whatever it is that he does, and, and Jojen reads prophetic dreams and stuff, all of that is magic that has kind of come down and is left over from the children of the forest. So they were kind of like the elves, I guess. Oh, no, no, no. I'm talking about the reeds, the actual, the brother and sister. Okay. Sorry. No, that's fine because I didn't know, I didn't know any of that either. All right. (laughs) So the reeds father fought with Ned Stark at the Tower of Joy. And he was one of, he was one of his bannermen. And so when they had to pay fealty or renew their fealty or whatever, he sent his kids instead because he was an old man at that point. Okay. So he just kind of went to pay fealty or homage or whatever and ended up just sticking around because Jojen had his crazy dreams and knew that he was supposed to stay. Okay. So they're in the show, they kind of just show up, but in the book, they're in the vicinity. Right. They're there for a reason, and they they live sort of in the north. Okay. But it's in some kind of weird marshland, and they don't have castles. They just live in these icky marshes where everything is poison. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. Let's move so on. So the Winterfell was way better. Uh, I had I had one more moment, because we already talked about the mountain killing uh, Oberyn Martell. Uh, but real quick, I just wanted to mention one of my biggest, like, oh, no moments was when Brienne and the Hound fought. I was horrified because they're two of my favorite characters, and I felt sure one of them wasn't going to make it, and I didn't want to see either one of them die. I did not know who to root for in that fight because I didn't want either one of them to win because I just knew that that meant somebody was going to die. Right, and that was my problem. Was was I? I couldn't. I, I almost couldn't even watch it. It was that was. Ugh, I didn't like it. Uh, okay, so let's move on to most rewarding moments. Uh, what what do you have? Uh, and, and we can do, you know, a couple. What, what did you have topping your list? Jeez, I didn't know I could have a couple. <laughs> well, if um, you've just got one, you've just got one. That's fine. <laughs> so, okay, I, I do have a few, I guess. But... The first one that I could think of was Cersei blowing up the Sept because I was so sick of the Tyrells. Yeah. And the and the Sparrows, that crazy religious cult and the High Sparrow, even though I love that actor, I was so sick of all of them. 
and then Lancel and his craziness. I was just ready for all of them to go. So getting to see them all blown up at once was not only shocking, but it was fantastic. <laughs> and I was happy to see every one of them go. Yeah, that was... And it's so funny to to look at it that way, but it was a rewarding moment because at this point in time, we had seen Cersei brought low. Uh, and while I didn't necessarily... Well, I certainly didn't think that her character had been redeemed or anything, but we had seen her be through... We've seen her go through so much horrible stuff, and seeing her get sweet revenge on all those people, even though she's a quote-unquote bad guy, was awesome. And it just solidified her as, don't fuck with her. Because yeah. she, she had been brought so low, and you didn't think that you know, maybe maybe she was going to get revenge like she did by chaining up that septa in the dungeons, but you certainly didn't ex- expect her to blow up an entire sept full of people. Um, I, I've got a few written down here, and I, we can just kind of gloss over them because we do need to move on. But uh, my my favorite, most rewarding moments were when the dragons uh, slay Piat Pri, uh, the wizard in. Uh, Oh shoot! What's Kirk? yes? Doesn't that include yes? yes. Uh, because you at, at that point we're still so new to the show, we don't know what's happening, we don't know who can do what, and they put Daenerys in the chains, and you're like, oh my gosh, is this the whole next season going to be her chained up in this tower or whatever? And they immediately just kill that guy, and she's like, nope, let's go. I'm taking over. Uh, that was great. Uh, Daenerys making Tyrion her hand was awesome, and it was such a big moment for Tyrion with with everything that he's been through and done to have the station that was sort of foisted upon him, uh, or, or not not that same station, but when he was made the uh, the what the accountant or whatever, uh, coin. Yes, master of coin. To have that sort of put upon him, and now to have this that he has earned, and he's worked his way back up from the from literally being a slave to that was great. And then uh, the Saris getting crowned by Cal Drogo was fucking awesome. Yes, it was. Because that guy was just the shits. Uh, so let's move on to our most evil villain. I'm very curious to know who you think is the most vile and evil villain from Game of Thrones. I actually picked Littlefinger. Oh, okay. There are more vicious and more violent villains, but ultimately Ramsay and Euron and, and Joffrey were all just vicious, petty little dicks. But Littlefinger was so much more conniving and so much more diabolical than all of them. He got he basically started all of this because he got Lysa to kill John Aaron, which brought Ned Stark to King's Landing. Then he gets Ned killed. Then he doesn't help the love of his life, Catelyn Stark, sells Sansa into rape and torture with Ramsay, tries to pit the Stark kids against each other, and you still really never know what his endgame is. Like, what, he, doesn't think, he doesn't want to sit on the Iron Throne. He certainly knows he can't do that. So what is he after? With all of these machinations, what is he trying to do? But he certainly gets a lot of people killed without ever dirtying his hands. Yeah, I, I can't even disagree that he is the biggest human villain of the show like 100 percent. but i i had to go with ramsey bolton because on screen he was the person that just straight up disgusted me the most uh that that had the most i guess immediate unacceptable horrible actions and the reason he won over Joffrey is because Ramsey, everything that he does, he's very aware of how atrocious it is, how horrible he is, 
and the the suffering that he's inflicting upon other people. He knows what he's doing. Joffrey, yeah. Joffrey is almost like mentally impaired. Like he's <laughs> like he's like an idiot kid squashing a bug. He he's not to me intentionally evil. He just is. He's almost like Michael Myers or something. Petty, he's just petty and selfish and doesn't even think about what he's doing is evil or not. Ramsey probably knows he's pretty evil. Yeah, Ramsey knows what a horrible person he is, and he loves it. He delights in it. Uh, and that that's why, to me, he's... The, and, and his, again, his evil was the most apparent and the most present out of, out of anybody's, uh, just on an episode-by-episode episode basis. And, 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 of course, both characters... Uh, met their ends in extremely satisfying ways that could also go on any any reasonable person's most rewarding moments list. Uh, let's see. Most heroic character. Uh, I'll start on this one. Uh, we already talked about Varys, who I, I kind of had to really think about if I felt that he was or not. But the only reason... I didn't pick him is because he has a slightly better sense of self-preservation than Jon Snow. Jon Snow is completely selfless. He will die for literally any cause that he believes in at any time, whereas Varys will do anything up to and not including dying uh, to, to preserve the kingdom. So I think Varys is a little more selfish than Jon Snow. And, and, but everything we see of Jon Snow, he's just trying to save lives and do the right thing. He is, and I, I can agree with that. It's just that his his sense of nobility has gotten him into so much trouble, just like all the other Starks, though. <laughs> right, but that's, I mean, that's an aspect of heroism. And I, I agree with that, and I do think that he is probably the most the most noble character on the show as well, because not only does he put himself in danger, but he, he goes and helps anybody who's in trouble. Yes. Oh, you can help. I'll be there in a minute. Oh, I shouldn't leave Winterfell. Well, got to go do some good. So who uh, was Jon Snow your pick? Actually, it wasn't. Oh, I picked Brienne again. Oh, inter- okay. Because she fails miserably so many times. <laughs> but bless her heart, she tries so hard. To me, she is even more in earnest than Jon Snow. Because initially she starts her storyline with just, she's an ugly lady in love with Renly. But she quickly becomes so much more than that. She doesn't even know Catelyn Stark, and yet she pledges herself to her to go and save her daughters, who she has no idea who they are. So I don't know how she ever thought she'd find them, but (laughs) she sure tries. Well, that's high fantasy for you. Yeah. And the way she protects Jamie, even though she hates him, she still tries to save his life. That is, I think, maybe that's the one thing she succeeds at. And she does get her she does get her nice revenge moment when she gets to kill Stannis, even though we don't get to see it happen. Yeah, and that that sort of confused me a little bit at first because, as I've mentioned a couple times now, the on screen death is like a kind of a thing. Yeah. Like if they don't die on screen or if they don't die yeah. in a very visible way, uh, you don't know for sure. But Stannis seemed like he was for sure absolutely dead, but they didn't show no, it for some good. reason. For a while, I kept expecting him to pop back up. Right. Because since we didn't see it, I was like, well, maybe she showed him some mercy after all, and he'll just pop back up in a minute. And then he has still been gone, so I guess I guess he really is dead. Well, and when, when she confronted uh, Melisandre, she, she, uh, Brienne said, I executed him myself. I passed his sentence and executed him myself. So, I mean, he's dead, but it was just an, a, for this show, that was an odd way to carry it out because it, it, it generally revels in, in showing the gore and the guts. Exactly. It's not like they haven't shown a beheading before. Right, right. But I, I do think also Brienne taking Podrick under her wing and helping him learn to be a proper squire, which Tyrion couldn't do because he wasn't much of a fighter, 
and then her her just satisfaction, even though she knows that it wasn't because of her seeing the Stark family back together in Winterfell, knowing that maybe she didn't bring them all together, but they're together, and and she's Catelyn can rest easy or whatever. She she's just so good and so noble, and I do think she's probably going to get killed at some point, but I'm hoping. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I think she's going to make it, but we'll see. Uh, okay, so we we know who we like. Who is somebody that you think you should like, but you have to really sit and think and convince yourself? Okay, this yes, this character is is good, and I should be rooting for them. Samuel Tarley. Oh, oh, that's a good choice. I didn't, you know, I didn't think about him because of this last run through. I just genuinely liked him, but you're totally right because I hated him at first. Yes. Now, it, you know, this last season, he has made himself more useful and he has done things and found important things and he has gotten a little bit less cowardly but at first i was just like oh my god do i have to sit and watch this guy because they knew in the books he was still alive by the end of book five (laughs) so when i first start watching the show i'm just like oh my god i have to sit through how many seasons of this guy that's uh, oh that's such a good choice that that might even be that might be better than my choice oh and that that romance that was so tacked on with him and that girl with no chin oh gilly be nice yeah. to Gilly. The the two of them having sex was more disturbing to me than that scene with Sansa and Ramsay. <laughs> oh, don't you don't you fat shame and no chin shame people on this show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not fat shaming. It was just he he just was not an interesting character to me. <laughs> See, I I genuinely liked him this last time around, but but it did take. It took thought and it took knowing the outcome of his character for me to go back and enjoy him in the earlier seasons. Uh, my my pick for character that I have to sort of constantly remind myself to like is Sansa. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, she's she has been through horrible things. She has had, obviously, really maybe the worst... Well, probably not the worst. I don't know if I could I could say that. But she's had one of the worst times of anybody on the show. Uh, but she, there's something inherently unlikable about her, which the show establishes from the beginning. She's the one that wants to be a princess, who wants fancy things, who like isn't action-packed, cool Arya. So she had a little bit of a tougher role set out for her. No, she was the one who was in love with Joffrey. Right, right. But the thing is, the whole in love with Joffrey thing initially started off in that stereotypical little girl who wants to be a princess way, but right. then became necessity. Like, for her very life, that's that's the outlook she had to, to put out there. Uh, she has had to make so many difficult decisions. She has had to deal with so many horrible people. Uh, so, like, she's she's a good character. Uh, she's worth liking, but she's just still has that sort of inherent stuffiness about her, I guess. Uh, she she has a resting bitch face that is hard to overlook. <laughs> and I know that she has been through some horrors, but at some point, you've also got to start looking around yourself and going, so Littlefinger did all these evil things to me. I'm going to keep him around. Why? Well, no, but I think the show... Pre- I, I think that's the thing, is the show did a good enough job of backing her into corners that you know all of these seemingly dumb decisions she makes are very forgivable for the situation that she's in up until the end when you know John is going to take this tiny army off into battle foolishly but he's doing what he thinks is right and he's trying to 
uh, you know, do do his Jon Snow thing, and Sansa realizes he's going to get murdered. I have to, the you know, even though she told Littlefinger to fuck off, the I think it was the prior season or maybe at the beginning of that season. Uh, I can't remember where it was in relation to Battle of the Bastards, but Littlefinger was out of the picture, and she had to reopen that line of contact to save John and all of these people. Which, granted. Maybe she should have done it a little sooner, but then we wouldn't have had our dramatic last-minute save. Uh, because that that's actually another, that Battle of the Bastards, I, I almost can't watch it. It's so intense. Did, did it upset you that much to see Rick and die? Uh, well, no, 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 not even that. Because <laughs> if his dumb ass can't weave, then he deserves an arrow through the chest. Uh, no, just that that battle one knowing that that Jon Snow is the heroic guy that he is and that he's sort of the last of the the Stark the Stark men anyway uh and knowing how awful Ramsay is and those those final moments where the bodies are stacked up everybody's suffocating and the way it was filmed is incredible uh, yeah, when, when Jon Snow claws his way out of there and takes that breath. Oh my gosh, it's so claustrophobic. Like, you sit there and watch that scene and you can't breathe. Yeah, it's uncomfortable. Uh, and then, the, the you know, the shield men are, are circling them and all hope is lost. And it's just, I, I've watched that. That's another episode that I've watched on its own, like apart from the season several times. And every time you just get lost in that battle and you, you don't, how long is this going to go on? Ah, uh, it's it's very very well done, even though it sort of comes at at the cost of uh, logic, because it's a little ridiculous that the the Knights of the Vale, just right before Jon Snow's about to get murderized, they come running around the corner I'm, like a Monty Python thing. They were standing on top of a hill, like, uh, is he about to die now? No? Right, right. And now, okay, go now. Yeah. Yeah, but it's still, I mean, it's it's a fantastic, dramatic uh, battle, and and if it it would have been disappointing if it had gone down any other way. Like if the Knights of the Vale had shown up, or like right as they were getting ready to fight, or if they'd they'd been there to rescue Rickon, it would have been like, okay, well that happened. It, it would have taken away so much of the drama and impact. So I'm I'm fine with it. It 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 met my criteria for balancing my suspension of disbelief with my enjoyment of spectacle. Uh, so, let's see here. Coolest setting, and this is just whatever, whether it's a specific building or, or castle or an entire area of the continent or whatever, or one of the continents, I guess. Uh, what what was your cool, like, what did, what did you most enjoy seeing our characters inhabit? Dragonstone. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. There's dragons carved everywhere. That throne is bad ass it's way cooler than the iron throne i agree 100 percent. she should absolutely just stay there and sit in that badass dragon glass chair yeah dragonstone is is awesome uh even though it would be a huge pain in the ass to walk up those stairs anytime you wanted to go to the beach yeah that's true but but it is but it, it's a very cool setting, all the volcanic rock and everything, and the the way the strata is is represented in the walls and in the throne. It's just, it it's awesome. It it's a great great setting. You know what I didn't realize, and this is going to sound so dumb. I did not realize that that's where Stannis was. But it had the same table. Right, but I thought. See, I don't know. That maybe there's just a guy that makes those tables. <laughs> yeah, maybe like because if you think of it in modern terms, well, sure, all the rulers have their own little table with their own little game pieces they plan all the time. And like I did, I'm not gonna lie, I did think it was odd that they had the same table. But even the way the room was lit and the way it was inhabited was different between when Stannis was there and when Daenerys was there, and I found this out because I had to look it up so I didn't feel as dumb. They actually did have to rebuild that room for the later season because there were so many more actors in it that they couldn't get cameras in there to film with the way it was set up before. 
Okay. But yeah, I was like, wait a minute, this is where Stannis was. It's not just an extremely similar looking room with the exact <laughs> same table. <laughs> what, what we're wondering was when they go into Dragonstone, like, okay, so Stannis is left. Were, were there not any squatters? Did did nobody move in? They just walked in, and Dragonstone was like, "Well, it's an island." Ready to go? It's an island. Like it's literally Wait. just a military <laughs> fortress there. I can't imagine somebody wouldn't say, "Hey, free castle." Uh, they've got other things to worry about. Yeah, and, right. and, and as you as you can see with uh, Braun, not just any castle will do. <laughs> how, how about that one? <laughs> oh, he's so great. Uh my my favorite setting in the show is Dorn. Uh, what? Okay, it's more the people of Dorn that oh, I hate. Than sure, Nick. sure. But but like setting-wise, <laughs> it's this really just beautiful like all the architecture is gorgeous, everything there, all the floral stuff, like it's just it's beautiful. It looks like a theme park almost. And that's really all I've got. I just like Dorn. Okay. <laughs> so we'll we'll move well, on. Said, my problem with Dorn is the people in it. That's all. Yeah. Uh, no, I I agree. I agree. Uh, and it's really weird seeing. Uh, oh shoot, Ilaria Sand. Is that right? Yes. It's so weird seeing her with all the good guys in the la- in the last season. Yeah, because she was not a good guy. No, no, not at all. She was bad. But again, that's the show showing us that these alliances that people form out of necessity because they view you know, whoever is the bad guy. Like They don't necessarily like each other, but they have to work together. The alternatives are way worse. Right. Uh, so Once let's talk. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about the best costume on the show. In a show full of incredible wardrobe, beautiful costumes, badass armor, just all kinds of amazing stuff, what is your pick for your, your favorite thing that somebody's worn? Um, I couldn't think of anything super specific that stuck out except for the cock ring that Santa has been wearing around her neck for like the last two seasons. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. And it's so super distracting. <laughs> but she just keeps on wearing it. Well, we... I, you know, I love, I love all of the costumes and they're gorgeous. And I do love all the, the Winterfell stuff with everybody's got wolves wrapped around them basically. But there wasn't one specific costume or anything that, that stuck out to me, at least. And apparently those those cloaks are made from Ikea rugs. Really? Yeah, I, I read that at some point, that that was an Ikea rug that the costume designers like bought and weathered and cut and whatever else. That makes for easy cosplay. Uh, we've actually already mentioned my favorite costume from the show, and that is Cersei's coronation dress. There's just, and, and it's funny because it's fairly simple. I mean, it's a lot of black, but I don't think there's, there has never been anything more striking on the show than her in that dress, the scene where uh, they're, they're putting all the parts together and then they put the crown on top of it all. That is just incredible. That is, that's one of the best visuals from the show, I think. But it also helped that her face says, I give zero fucks right now. Yes. Uh, but I do agree. Her costumes have been great, too. Yeah, all of it. Well, they, I mean, they all are. They're all just incredible, except for maybe the High Sparrow. I mean, not so much going on with that guy. Yeah. And the whores. The whores don't really get very good costumes, either. Do they get costumes? <laughs> well, some of them. Uh, what's her name? Roz did. Roz, Roz had her her billowy dress that she floofed up at uh, Theon. Yeah, okay. And and Shay had a dress once in a while. Yeah, Shay got to dress okay a couple times. Uh, so, best season. My pick for the best season is season four because, uh, and, and I'm just going to run through it. 
so you can get to yours. Uh, we get the Martells. Joffrey dies. Sansa escapes, sort of. Daenerys frees Slaver's Bay. Baby turned into Walker. Littlefinger revealed as the source of everyone's problems. Hodor gets warged, which was badass said for Hodor eventually, but it was cool to see Hodor just kick ass. We actually see how Daenerys handles being a queen. Theon doesn't go with Yara, which was brutal and just awful. Uh, Tyrion gets to deliver his fuck all y'all speech at his trial. Uh, we got Ed Scrain as Dario Naharis, who I preferred very much over the other guy that played him. And, uh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, I liked him a lot more. Yes, much better. Uh, the Adventures of Arya and the Hound and the Battle of Castle Black, which they actually put in theaters because it was so damn good. Uh, so that was uh, season four. Just is when I, when I look back, like they're all great, but season four is the one that just is loaded with amazing stuff. What is your uh, favorite season and why? Well, my list of why isn't as long as yours, but <laughs> I went with season six because it was the first season where we were free from the books, and I had no clue what was going to fucking happen. Oh, that's that's very good reasoning. But that made it great for me because it was all it was all surprises to me, and I was happy to be surprised again for a change. But we also get Daenerys finally gets through dicking around in Reen. <laughs> Hodor being broken and finding out why he's broken. Um, the Tower of Joy, the Hound hanging out with Ian McShane, Arya finishing ninja school and murdering Walder Frey. And Santa finally getting useful, and those those were that was all I got. Uh, that's good enough. Well, honestly, just the fact that you got to be surprised by the show w- was plenty of reason because I, I absolutely, I mean, like I said, that's why I don't want to read stuff anymore if I haven't already. Is I want to enjoy the the medium for what it is. Uh, okay, so let's move on to best single episode, which I, I, is, was that harder or easier for you to pick than best season? Oh, it was way harder. Okay. That's, it was for me as well. Although I kind of knew when I said it, I kind of knew what I was going to pick. What was yours? I picked Blackwater just because of that big ass battle was the first really huge big visual CGI thing that they had done that the first giant battle that they did and it was the first thing that let me know this show is really not going to fuck around with battles yeah 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 that's a good call because it was the first time that it was like oh they're going to get big on this show and then if, if you had not read the books you would think that oh shit Tyrion might die and oh no what's going to happen to Davos and even having read the books, I was concerned for Davos because, <laughs> you know, with the show with so many characters and so little time, I didn't know that he he could pull through. So I was deeply concerned about Davos. But that was the biggest huge fuck all battle that they had that let me know this show was gonna was gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. Mine uh, mine also involved a big battle, and that was the Watchers on the Wall uh, with the the Battle of Castle Black. I, I have th- that it's incredible it's a, it's so cinematic it's so well directed uh the Igret meeting her fate is horrifying uh and ollie who at the time we we still like ollie when he kills her so it makes it even tougher to deal with but just the visuals of that battle are phenomenal. It's probably one of my favorite battle scenes in anything ever. Honestly, when I was going through my list of episodes, that one did not come up for me, but I can absolutely see why you'd say it, because it was amazing. It's and well, it, it was less CGI and, and over-the-top than Blackwater. It was much more visceral. Well, and I think if... If I had the unfortunate task of showing a single episode of the show to someone who had never watched it, I think that's certainly one that I would pick 
because it does there's a lot of standalone stuff in it that you can just sort of get swept up into although blackwater is is similar in that it, it, that it's very clear that that episode is building towards that conflict so i think both of those really either one of those would make a good episode to introduce somebody to the show uh okay we just got a couple things to cover before we wrap this thing up uh, did the show go too far with sex and violence? There's been a lot of controversy. A lot of people think that it was overly gratuitous and that they were doing it just to shock people. And I, I don't agree with any of that. I think it's always in context. I think it's a reflection of how society would be in this world. And I think it's absolutely ridiculous how offended people can get by the actions of villains like are we going to get to a point where the biggest villain in a movie or a, or a tv show is like cheating on tests or something <laughs> like it, where do we draw the line of what villains of what truly evil people do i think it's absurd how upset people get uh over over some of that kind of stuff and i i don't, I don't there's not a single instance of anything in Game of Thrones that I felt was gratuitous or uh, unnecessary. And I would go so far as to say I think the show is still tremendous. Uh, but I do think that they cowed to some of the complainers a little bit in the later seasons. Although also some of it may have just been at the expense of the plot continuing to gain momentum and not having you know as much time for, for tits and dongs anymore. Well, I mean, they they don't hang out in quite as many whorehouses as they used to. So, I mean, in, in a whorehouse context, yeah, there's going to be tits everywhere. And none of that stuff bothered me at all. Of course, Loris is going to walk around his bedroom naked with his boyfriend there. Right. Right. It's, of course he's going to. He's not going to go put on pants. <laughs> I, do, I do feel like they have lowered the number of boobs that you see, but in... Fairness, we're also hanging out in places now where tits aren't quite appropriate. Well, you know, around naked at Winterfell. So much of the narrative now is out in the open. You know, the reasoning for uh, a lot of the nudity before is that these were private conversations that were being held behind closed doors, and now the plot is is out in the open. And for the last two seasons, it really has been about people having to communicate and it, it hasn't just been these little uh, encounters in the same way that it was in the early seasons we don't we don't have time for nookie anymore it, unless it's john snow and daenerys ick right. we got all kinds of time for that right yeah i uh, actually up in in defense i wrote an article several years ago uh sp speaking up in defense of the scene where ramsey is deflowering Sansa on their wedding night. Yeah. It it had to happen for you to hate him that much. Well, and it's not even it's not even about that. It's that character, that's what had been established. It would have been absurd if he had gone in there and been like, "All right, sweetie, now you make yourself comfortable and I'm going to be really gentle with you and I'm not yeah. going to make your brother watch us." Like it would have been ridiculous if the show had done anything else. No, it would have seriously pissed me off. I, I might have gotten really angry at the show if they had done that. And it would have been a disservice to both characters if they hadn't shown it. And I know that sounds kind of gross, but if they had just done some off-screen thing where later on Sansa said, oh, what he did to me was so horrible, which they kind of did, because later on we, she sort of elaborates that it was even worse than what we sort of saw. Uh, it 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 would have. I just feel like it would have been a betrayal of of the characters and of the idea of the show to flinch away from that brutality. No, because the show does so much else that is brutal. Why is it okay for one kind of violence and not another? I, yeah, absolutely. Why you know the the depicting? Well, they they hung a child on screen, and that's right. uh, you know that's it, we we can't pick and choose. What what's the evil we want to see portrayed? Well, you can. You just don't watch the show if you don't like it. 
And I, I think you will find once you do read the books that what happens in the books is way worse than anything we actually got to see or even hear or I, imply. That's what I've heard, and I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> uh, all right, so to wrap this thing up, we know that the eighth season is coming up soon. Uh, honestly, I don't even particularly want to speculate on it because I've I've gotten out of the habit of trying to predict things and try and expect things. Like, I don't even really book wrestling anymore when I watch it because I like being surprised, and often my ideas are better than what actually happens. <laughs> so it's a good way to not be disappointed. Uh so instead of speculating on Season 8, which is starting in just a couple of days, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the new show and what we know about it. Uh, so far, the only thing I know is that Naomi Watts is going to be the star, which I think is awesome because I think she's great. And it's I believe it's set 10,000 years before the current show. Is that in line with what you know of it? That that also is all that I know of it. Okay, so they're they are keeping a tight lid on this thing. Then, uh, I I will say that I'm fine with the current show ending because I don't like things to last beyond their expiration date. I don't like it when things go too long and start to suck, and I stop watching them because they're not good anymore, rather than because they've wrapped everything up. So. I'm I'm happy that the show is ending. I mean, I'm I, you know I'm sad because I want to keep watching these characters, but this is the end. Like this is this is the conclusion of their story, and I'm okay with that. And and uh, we are going to get to see more of this world, and I'm sure it's going to be interesting. Uh, or how, how do you feel about everything, Beth? I 100% agree with you. These characters have had their time. Their story is done. And we can move on to something else. And I don't care if it's something else set later, set earlier. It's a huge world, and he spent a ton of time building it. And there's so much history he's put into it that why can't we just go back and, and continue in this world, but with something different? Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm going to give it a try. I, don't, I can't promise I'm going to love it as much, but I'm certainly going to watch it. Yeah, I'm I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. I just hope it doesn't take like five years before it actually starts. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but I think they're supposed to start filming later this year. So hopefully, maybe next fall uh, we'll see something new. All right, I think we've covered everything that I want to cover. You, do you have any final thoughts uh, about anything Game of Thrones related? No, I think I, I've exhausted all of my notes. Yeah, I've, I've exhausted my notes and myself. Uh, so, that being said, where can we find you online? What are you up to? Well, I am online at, on Twitter occasionally, at NeedlessBeth, on Instagram at Beth Rama, and you can read my stuff every other Thursday on NeedlessThingsPodcast.com. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on and talking about Game of Thrones, and I imagine we'll probably do a, a final season wrap-up uh, once that's done airing, because I'm sure we'll have plenty to talk about then. We will have six more pages of my notes to go through. Excellent. I need to look into uh, some Alpha Brain or something, like one of... One of the Onnit.com products that Stone Cold Steve Austin used to promote uh, when I was still listening to his podcast. Because it, it, Podcast One is harder to get to now. I don't know exactly what happened to it, and, and I haven't listened to Stone Cold in a while. But I, I need one of those mental stimulators because I am so overwhelmed right now. Uh, just, just with the work. It's the work thing. It's always the work thing. Uh... There, there, it's just too much. My brain is not... We were watching WrestleMania uh, the other night, and I was having trouble even connecting, like, who did what to who earlier in the year and, like, remembering through lines and stuff like that. I, matter of fact, I even... Right after the Baron Corbin-Kurt Angle match, uh, I said something about how Corbin lost, and he won. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, it's... I need some uh, some old-person brain antidote just just to get me by just give me a fix 
to keep the brain working for just a little bit longer uh, to get me through this rough patch at the old job. Uh, anyway, everything else is going pretty good. Uh, like I said, I've managed to get a couple of days off in here. I don't know what the rest of April or May is going to look like, but hopefully my trainee and the other trainee in my work group will be taking over by June and things will ease up then and I'll be able to enjoy the summer uh, with my family. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I hope everything is good in your lives. I hope your job isn't giving you hell, uh, although it probably is because that's what jobs do. Uh, I hope you've got a great spring and summer lined up. I hope you get to get out and have some fun. And uh, I love you guys. Thank you for listening to the Needless Things podcast. You're the best. You can find the show on iTunes, Stitcher, Downcast, or in the ears of a Trader Vix employee. Love you. Mean it. Uh-huh.